Ah, Bonnie Scotland. From historic battles to guard the Highlands, to putting on your Scottish finery and dancing to celebrate the win. You could be in Scotland, but journey with us to a place nay so far from home, to Penticton, British Columbia, to experience the wonder a world away. Where there are sights and sounds and tastes of Scotland. See the traditional dances of Ireland and Scotland. Hear the skirl of the pipes as they'd echo through the highlands. Taste the finely crafted whiskey known the world over. And feel the thunder of a hundred pipers marching past. We'll take you backstage and behind the scenes. Come with us in this series of discoveries to experience the arts. This time we cook up some scotch eggs and make a kilt by hand. But first, let's join an Irish step dance class. Oh, everybody is a little bit Irish. They, they really are. We, uh, I love going to seniors' homes because the, the music is really joyful and upbeat and really rhythmic, so people get really into it. Five, six, off, and squeeze, silly dumb. What are your arms doing? Silly dumb, hand down. Squeeze those arms. Yeah, Sophie, amazing. The kids are just so poppy and bouncy, and yeah, it's really positive. Good girls, finish those three. It's one more. One more. There you go. Good girl. Diddly, 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 dum. On my mom's side, my grandma, her mom was from Ireland, and my grandma on my dad's side was born in Ireland. And triple and toe, hop toe, and triple and toe. My grandma is dreaming of the day when I can go to Worlds and she can take me there and I can meet her family and stuff. One, two, three, one, two, three, bang! One, two, three, one, two, three, bang! One, two, three, one, two, three, bang! Hard shoes, they're generally a, like a one size fits all. So what we do is we have tape. So most dancers do tape their shoes if their shoes don't fit properly. So it just keeps your foot locked in so it's not slipping around. It also prevents blisters some of the time. I still get so many blisters and stuff, but it just helps keep the shoe where it's supposed to be. One, two, stop, three. And I like hanging out with the group. That's fun. And I love the competitions. I'm very competitive. They're called uh, Fesh Singular Fashana Plural. So we usually go to about two or three a year. The adjudicator, they note your number down and then they watch you as you dance and like they say, then they judge you on like how well you turn out your feet and how you stand on your toes and you point your toes and you keep your arms together and stuff. Try some music, just that part. Five, six, off we go. One, two, three. You guys, we did it again. When we stop, that either means one of us messed up or we're like, okay, what do we do? We wait for what Kira says and then we will do and then we'll restart and we'll do it till there and then. We don't know the entire thing because she'll teach us a little part by part, so we have to stop where the part we learned to. Left foot! If you stop, you just keep trying, or if you're stuck, you keep going, no matter what. Like in a competition, if you forget your dance, if you stop, you could get disqualified. So if you don't remember it, you just have to make up something and do it. <laughs> so a fesh is a competition. Um, the kids would be dancing in a row from different schools, but they'd all be dancing generally the same movements in a traditional step. 
where when we do our choreographed steps, like a reel or a slip jig, when there's two kids from competing schools, they're doing completely different dances all over the stage. So this is quite a uniform dance. Um, it's really focused on rhythm, uh, turnout, crossover, because the movements are a little bit smaller. There's movements you're not allowed to do in a traditional dance because they didn't exist when these dances were choreographed originally, like heel clicks. You couldn't do a heel click. You might kick your heel with your toe, but you wouldn't do a switch click. There's nothing um, really above the hips, it seems. Um, I always find the movements are quite tight and sharp. I, I love traditional dances. And so I'm still learning my old, older dances. I like them because lots of kids know them and they're very, like, they're in the Irish history and stuff. My grandpa's Irish. He is getting older and he's getting pretty sick, so my mom would send my grandma videos and my grandma would show him. I know that it's part of his heritage and I know that it's fun to do and I like showing people what I can do. Watching them get difficult rhythms and they celebrate it when they do it. I like watching them even get frustrated when they're trying to learn something because they're just working so hard and then you can tell that they've gone out of class and they've thought about it all week whether it's like their feet moving under their desk at school because I hear that all the time or you see them out and you see them in a grocery store and they're like jump from backs down the hall and you're behind them and that's that's cool. We'll come back to the dance class later, but first it's our trivia question. Which of these shows helped Irish dance become recognized around the world? One, two, three, full three, full three. Do it again. There's a huge variety of dances, there's thousands of them, and they vary in difficulty from ones that small children can do right up to a very athletic um, 20 and 30 year olds, and every, everything in between. Music is lovely. Our teacher, who is Rebecca Blackhall Peters, usually starts the class with something easy, like a mixer, which is like a circle dance, so that even a visitor who pops in for just one off or twice can join in for that particular dance. really that moves me. There's just layers and layers. Then there's the social part, there's the historical part, there's um, dancing in the long sets uh, as they did, you know, in the 1800s. There's getting dressed up for a formal ball. It's, um, yeah, it's all you just learn your steps, you learn your formations and then off you go and you can go anywhere in the world with your shoes and dance.
Hi, I'm Chef Chris Remington and I'm here to do a couple dishes for you. We're going to do a scotch egg. So what I'm going to do first, we just have uh, regular banger sausages. Uh, you buy them in the store. We just have to take the casings off. Once they're off, we're going to flatten them. And I've got some eight minute eggs. So once the water comes to a boil, throw your eggs in. Uh, give them eight minutes, take them out. Throw them in some ice water and uh, to cool them down and then to peel them, just have some running cold water and as you're peeling them, that'll help take some of any eggshells that are sticking to the outside. So what we've got is the banger meat. So we're gonna fold it in our hands and we're gonna make it flat. Now depending on the size of your eggs, whether you have small, medium or large, you might need one sausage, you might need one and a half. So what we're gonna do, we'll take a half one here. So mold it in your hand. So we're looking for that there, oblong. Now we're gonna take one rolled egg into the center and we're just going to roll this around. We want the sausage meat to completely encase the egg. Once we have that done, we'll move on to the next one. So the first one's done. Oh, sticky. There we are. And again, we'll just take one and a half. Move it around. Now the point to this is to make sure that the egg is completely covered and we are going to bake these at 350 degrees. It's going to take about half an hour, 35 minutes. You want to make sure the sausage meat is completely cooked. Now I know most people will want to deep fry the scotch egg, but we're trying to do, I don't know if it's any healthier, but we're going to try to do something a little bit easier than setting up a deep fryer on the stove and that going. So once we have our little balls made, one more, then we're going to bread them. So when you're breading anything, whether it's a scotch egg, whether it's chicken, whether it's pork, you want to have three things, flour, egg, and some form of breadcrumb, whether some people crush up um, cornflakes, some people crush up cr crackers, some people will do breadcrumbs. So what we want to have is the flour. What the flour does is it dries the product. And it dries the product so it enables the egg, which is wet, to stick to it. Now you've got a wet product again, you need to dry it, so you put it in the breadcrumbs. I'm using uh, panko breadcrumbs, a Japanese breadcrumb, and it, uh, just so that it gives it a little bit more of a crunch than a regular breadcrumb. So we have these done here. All we're going to do, roll it in flour. Once it's in the flour, again, just pat that off. I'm going to do that into the egg. Now, very important, once you're rolling it in the egg, this is now your wet hand. You want to keep one wet hand and one dry hand. Otherwise, it's going to get very gummy. So into there, now we switch hands. And we roll that in the breadcrumbs. Now, onto the baking sheet. And again, dry hand in the flour. And then from there, we go into the egg. Now we switch to the wet hand. Once everything's coated in egg, we go over to the breadcrumbs and we go back to the dry hand. Okay, everything there. And one last one. If you wanted to make these up ahead of time and you were gonna freeze them, what I would suggest is you make them. Do not bread them. Just take the straight sausage with the egg on the inside. Take that tray, put it in the freezer. Once they're frozen, then you can transfer them to a Ziploc bag. They'll hold their shape better. And uh, once you thaw them out, then you can bread them uh, and put them back in the oven. Again, we're going to do it 350. Take about uh, 30 minutes, 35 minutes until your sausage is cooked all the way through. You know what? I had uh, the pleasure of living in, living in Edinburgh for a year. Uh, I worked at a couple of hotels. I worked at a seafood restaurant as well. So... I mean, it's always, everybody seems to have that joke running with Scotland that it's fried Mars bars and everything is fried. and It's not. I mean, you have access to some amazing wild game, um, mushroom foragers, um, and you're also a lot closer to a lot of the warmer cli climates in Europe as well. So a lot of that food comes over. And uh, the seafood is unbelievable. And you get a chance to play around with that. And as... Um, Myself and many other chefs have spent a lot of time 
traveling around the world and working with not only different chefs, but different regions and different restaurants and different styles. And you get a chance to pick and choose from each one of those. And then you come up with your own ideas. So things like take the scotch egg, for example, I've made it um, with the pork sausages. I've blended the pork sausages with a little bit of uh, black pudding and mix that into the mix. Um, I've had it where you can take just pieces of the black pudding, put it inside with the egg. And I mean, there's, there's so many different ideas and so many different ways of doing these dishes. So scotch eggs, it's been half an hour. So the point is we want to make sure that the sausage meat is cooked and you have an internal temperature of above 165 degrees. Okay, so again, those eight minute eggs, the inside isn't gonna quite be done, but the point to it is that they will finish cooking here and it keeps it from going. There we have oven baked scotch eggs. So you should finish off your egg cooked, sauce and meat moist. That's what we're looking for. You don't want to have that ugly gray ring around the yolk, so that's why water boiling. Eggs go in, eight minutes, take them out, throw them in ice water. So you're left with just this little bit left in the center, but it keeps that yolk nice and bright still. So things like, take the scotch egg for example, I've made it um, with the pork sausages. I've blended the pork sausages with a little bit of uh, black pudding and mix that into the mix. Um, I've had it where you can take just pieces of the black pudding, put it inside with the egg and I mean, there's, there's so many different ideas and so many different ways of doing these dishes. Hey Mandy, going to get started on this RCMP tartan kilt. Oh yeah, for the Summerland pipes and drums. Yeah. So kilts are all traditionally 100% hand stitched. And that's what we're really trying to kind of go back to. We're keeping it traditional and we're making sure that we just stick to the hand-stitched uh, method. Every kilt is a little bit different uh, because it depends on the, the size of the waist and hips, uh, how big the pleats are, and how many pleats there are in a kilt. Each kilt is custom made that way. So it's, it's the way that it, that it sits and, and hangs and, and forms around the body. I was born and raised in Scotland until about 16 years old and ended up coming to Penticton, BC to go to the Okanagan Hockey Academy. Ended up meeting my wife going to school here. Anyway, it wasn't until we decided to go back to Scotland to, to introduce our kids to my parents and my side of the family that we really actually got a, a start in kilt making. A realisation that kilt making was actually more of a dying art at that time, you know, versus a, you know, an up and coming trend. You know, for every kilt maker that dies, you know, there's, nobody takes it up. So we decided to actually take it on and uh, try and become kilt makers. When we're sewing the pleats together here, we have to really make sure that the lines across the way here are all lined up. What we're trying to do with this one here is make the, the back look like the front. So the pleats have to match the pattern. A number of years ago, I started tenor drumming with the pipe band and uh, we, we just kind of joined along with, with that. And it's something that uh, I'm really passionate about is uh, keeping the Scottish culture alive and uh, in Canada as well, because it's, it's very much a part of, of Canada's culture and identity. I am so proud of, of my daughter um, doing the, the Highland dancing. 
Uh, she loves it. She loves competing. She's very competitive. I encouraged our kids to get into the, the, the culture as well in the way of uh, our daughter does Highland Dance. Our son and daughter both are learning the chanter. He'll be a real good piper one of these days, you know, which is exciting to see. And just the, the passion in his eyes for it, you know, it, it blows me away. It would make me feel happy when I'm just playing, having my hands on the chanter, or having my hands on the bottom half, just playing away. I think it's pretty cool. And how that it's a hard instrument, but once you learn how to play, it's actually pretty fun. And then seeing our daughter, our daughter dancing, just unbelievable. We went to Scotland and uh, I just really got caught up with the culture and uh, just fell in love with it. So um, here we are. You know, for us, it is something where we, we love the, the kilt making aspect of it. And we actually want to have people who enjoy kilt making to come check it out, you know, see what it's all about. You know, uh, to me, it, it's heritage. It's something that's really special. Different tartans, you know, the modern colours or the ancient colours or the weathered. A very unique tartan in that it's uh, reproduction colours. So what they've done with the colours here is uh, they've taken um, samples from uh, colours from the 1700s and they've reproduced them to look uh, exactly like the colours of the, the tartans that um, they used to have. Uh, back then, uh, and uh, this one here is called uh, the Pollock Tartan, and it's Pollock reproduction. So instead of uh, the, the bright greens that were in them, they've put the nice um, kind of softer browns in it, um, and then the more faded reds that they would have had. We make family heirlooms. That's um, what the kilt is. So he knows that this, this kilt that he's getting made for him is going to be passed down from generation to generation. And, you know, his, his grandkids are going to look at this kilt and go, oh yeah, my, my grandfather was married in this kilt. And, and it's just creating that history and something that, that'll last for a very long time. Really hoping that, you know, through time that our kids actually might want to take this on. So it's up to Mandy and I to turn this, what we have right now, into a viable business, as they say, you know, and make it so that, you know, come time when our kids are ready to take it over, it is something that they can pursue and we can teach them the proper ways of making kilts to carry it on for another generation. You just couldn't help but hear the skirl of the bagpipes if you were anywhere near the Penticton Scottish Festival. Piping and drumming competitions are a major component of these Highland Games. Visiting from Burnaby and taking in the whole cultural experience is Craig Rodriguez, whose daughter Lauren is competing. I quite enjoy watching the uh, heavy events like the caber toss and, and uh, stuff like that. Uh, I don't normally get to see that kind of stuff. And we also get to see a lot of the vendors that come out here with Scottish wares. Uh, she's coming on very well. Uh, this is her first year doing solos. Uh, so she's learning quite a bit about it. Uh, this is where she really challenges us herself more than uh, normally in a band situation. There's band practice twice a week uh, on Tuesday nights and Sunday mornings and then we come up to all the Highland Games. I think this year we have six games to go to between Canada and the United States. Pipers and drummers range in age and ability and all have their own reason for being here. I don't know I'm just a competitive person and I like making any of my hobbies competitive and it just gives it that little drive. Kudos to Penticton for putting on this great event. It's a lot of fun. Judy Campbell is competing at a grade three level and appreciates the feedback she gets from the judges. Competition is always good um, because it makes you work. It's like, it's like having a deadline. So you, so you work harder getting ready for a competition and therefore your piping gets better. Piping is a family affair for Michael Jones, who's come to Penticton with his bagpipe playing sons. Absolutely beyond proud of those guys. They're becoming very good pipers and basically our life is piping. So once we're done here, we're going up to the Piping Hot Summer Drummer School for two weeks. So this is all we do through the year. It's nonstop. We're traveling back and forth from the island just about every weekend, if not every other weekend. But uh, it's, it's great. Absolutely love it. Would, couldn't, wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. The longtime pipe sergeant with the world famous SFU Pipe Band brings his pipers here every year because competition hones their musical skills. Judging solo piping is definitely multi-level. 
Uh, the judge is listening for several things. Firstly, a nicely tuned bagpipe. The instrument itself must be nice to listen to. Excellent fingering. There's a lot of tricky technique on the pipes and uh, it takes some practice and instruction to get the hang of it so it does sound clean and tidy and nice. So that's a very big issue. And the third thing is the musicality. So with a piper can put it all together and make a nice musical package with their performance. So experienced judges listening to all three of those things at the same time and tend to make notes as they're going and, and speak to the piper at the end with feedback. Drummers are an important part of every pipe band. We spoke to one of the judges who's come here from Scotland for this event. Drumming here is, in this part of the world is absolutely booming just now. There's just so many kids that want to do it and they're you know, very, very talented kids. Lots of great teachers, so it's, pipe band drumming's in a very healthy place just now in this part of Western Canada. Bonnie boat like a bird on the wing onward the sailors cry carry the lad is born to be king over the sea to sky loud the winds howl loud the waves roar oceans are royal Baffled our foes Stand on the shore Follow They will not dare Speed Bonnie boat Like a bird On the wing Onward the sailors Cry Carry The lad That's born to be King over sky Though the waves leap soft 
shall ye sleep the ocean's royal bed rocked in the deep flora will keep watch by your weary head speed bonnie boat like a bird on a wing onward the sailors cry Lad that's born to be king over the sea to sky. Many's a lad fought on that day. Well, the claymore could wield. When the night came, silently lay dead on Culloden. Bonnie boat like a bird on the wing onward the sailors cried carry the lad that's born to be king over the sea to sky With 60-plus years of piping under his belt, Nigel Alakia is well-known as a teacher and band leader. We caught up with Nigel for a chat about his music career. Does one ever really retire from piping, or is it still part of your life? You say that because I'm retired from what piping used to mean for me, because now I'm retired, and maybe something like yourself, I'm doing kind of piping just for fun. I think when you were doing piping, when you were into it big time, you said it was fun, but there was a lot of serious stuff going on there, almost professional. Now I'm doing piping with an older group, and it's strictly fun. But it's something today, I love going to the games now when I, I'm not the pipe major, I'm not running the games, and I just find that fabulous. I've been involved with these games which were in Penticton way back, uh, way back, I think in the 30s, 40s, 50s. And when I came here, the Penticton Highland Games were really big. Uh, myself, my wife ran the Penticton Pipe Band and, and the games uh, way back in the early 80s. And we had uh, 26 pipe bands wow. that came to the games. Uh, one from New Zealand. And there was a lot of people that were in the band at that time that were really involved in these things. You couldn't do it all on your own. There was a lot of people. I think a bit of that has gone out of it. It's harder to get volunteers today, isn't it? I think as soon as you hear the bagpipes, you see Highland dancers, and you see the tossing off the caber and all that, that's a hard thing to put on. And I think that for this, you know, the size of Penticton, and having that is great. I'm sure Kelowna and some other cities around here would love to have what the, you know, the games, the Highland Games that Penticton are putting on. They would love that. I, I certainly like it. And um, the Scottish Festival here group in Penticton are doing a great job. Well, you gave me a fantastic job at the last games. And I love that because I love talking to people so I could go and talk to the judges, talk to the spectators, and uh, everybody that I met are having a great time. The games were first class, and uh, I, of course I love talking about, especially older people are inclined to talk about old times, enjoy the new times, but we're all back in the, the Donald McLeod era or some era way back, so. But they like that too, because we're giving them a bit of the old history. Well, my idea for a parade is not much good without a pipe band. I, I don't care what band goes down, and I like other bands too, by the way. But if there's no pipe band, that parade was, yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, there is there is a story about parades. When I ran the Pentic Pavement, this is one I do remember. We went to we always went down to Omak, the Stampede. We did that for years. Uh, my kids hated it because it was about 95 degrees. Uh, luckily, we had a big enough band. Maybe we had about 15, 20 pipers that time, and we did the parade, and it was we were getting four hundred dollars or something. This was great. So we did the parade, and we're all exhausted, but they didn't have enough bands. So we're, as we were coming to the end, this guy comes up. We'll give you another four hundred dollars if you'll go into the parade again. Now listen, this is a bad. So. <laughs> I'm um, after the pipe band. They're all wanting to go into the pub or go to the... And I says, boys, we're doing the parade again. I thought they were, I was going to get lynched. But remember, I had enough power. Like, y you have to be fairly powerful as a pipe major because most pipe majors, th they might be in a pedestal, but nobody likes pipe majors. Not really. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, we did the parade. And they were quite happy because it was another $400 American in the coffers. But it's a thing I do remember. <laughs> Not once, but twice. Oh, twice. And the OMAC parade's no fun. <laughs> so there you are. Well, because of a distinct sound, let's take even Penticton. I'm retired now. And uh, I'll go down the street. If I hear, it doesn't matter who the piper is. If it's somebody at a street corner, and my wife wants to go this way, I'm going that way. <laughs> if I see, uh, say, Kim, who teaches here, with kids at a corner or anything, I'm there and I'm talking to them because I'm, sometimes they're busy and I realize I'm, I'm here to talk. I'm busy right now, I'm too, but I'm there. So anybody who's interested, like I am in piping, you're drawn to the sound. And not everybody is, but if you are, you, you can't go by it.
you guess the correct answer? Riverdance performed on the Eurovision Song Contest in 1994 as Interval Entertainment for the contest. Their first theatre production debuted in 1995. Now let's get back to class at the Castilla School of Irish Dance. Then, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, brush and toe. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three brush and toe. One, two, three, three, full three, full three. Do it again. Okay, one, three. It's the type of thing where when you get home, it's kind of stuck in your head, so you just kind of like dance around the house. And my feet, my feet will just be like dancing or even at school, my feet are always moving. Um, and yeah, it's just kind of an easy thing to be doing, like multitasking, I guess. Like I come here two days a week and it's really fun to do because I'm just here with my friends and I'm learning a bunch of things. And I go to competitions and that's really fun too. And also just seeing how well they all work together. It's quite a solo sport, but if you could look in there right now, they help each other out and like Sophie's yelling at me when I'm doing something wrong or like help comes over and helps Sawyer because Sawyer is nine and these girls are a lot older than her and she's just picking up these steps like it's it's hard work and she's doing really well and they're I don't know it's just a good group of kids they're really supportive and they're fun to be around. Kira has always been my teacher. We try to make it so that everybody has a, a role to play and they do really well. I think Kira is definitely by far the best. When I was five, um, my parents were in the Irish Society in Kelowna, and um, the lady who was sort of in charge of everything there, Ethna Tut, uh, did Irish dance lessons in her basement, and so I was put into those. I love Kira so much. <laughs> she, oh, I've known her for so long. I was actually her very first student, and I'm the last one left. There was a group of three of us that started um, with Kira when she started teaching and so I was kind of like her lab rat. I was her experiment. <laughs> um, but it's been really really fun being able to work with Kira and having her instruct me. because She's what builds the community, right? And like without her, I don't know. <laughs> she's, she's just been there my entire life. It's like a second family. It's the best music. It's the best kids. Um, it's definitely changed a lot since I started dancing. Um, things have gotten really technically different. Uh, we're still keeping some of the tra traditional movements, like their arms stay down, their feet are very crossed um, and turned out, but there's definitely some other influences have come into Irish dancing. You're jumping into three drums, turning in a circle, following your right shoulder. And one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, brush and toe. Yeah. So listen. It's like toe, heel, and then you step with your back foot. Um, that's a good one too. Nice. After a while, you just kind of get the feel of it, and the rhythm is not too hard to find unless you're doing a really complicated step. I just love the community and people that I get to meet throughout competitions. Like I've met people from across Canada and it's been really, really cool doing that. And also the fitness aspect of it because I would not do anything if it weren't for dance. <laughs> Okay, so what do Scotsmen do, especially Burnley Scotsmen? What do they do with these cavers when they're lying around? Uh, they find fun in throwing them around. Yes, they throw them around for fun, that's right. And the event became known as what? Caber toss. 
cable toss right, of course, the iconic, one of the many iconic things that you'll see at the Penticton Scottish Festival, the cable toss. And we're parading the ladies in the kilts this morning, Lassie and Portia wearing their lovely little kilts. So the caber toss is a really athletic event for burly Scotsmen and young children as well. So we're going to start off with Josh McTavish here who's going to demonstrate how to pick up the caber and toss it. So pick it up carefully lad, watch your back, bring it up. And pick it up, watch your back, bend low. That's right, oh, and you got a balance, it's all about balance, and you're gonna try to throw it, lad, and try to flip it end over end. Oh, give it a toss, laddie, oh, good job, lad, look at that, a perfect 12 o'clock. That would be a high score in caber tossing. Oh, that's fantastic, that's right, you're trying to throw it end over end. Oh, it's going for the challenge caber. Oh, good heavens, pick it up, lad. Careful, watch your back. It's heavy, very heavy. Uh, walk forward a little bit. Careful, watch your balance. Don't wipe out anyone in the audience. We might need them. Okay, take a few steps forward, bit more, and give it a toss. Oh, good job, lad. A perfect 12 o'clock. These are high scoring children. Good happens. This is fantastic. There's an African proverb, and it says um, if you can walk, you can dance. So, I think for most people that can move, even walking to music, can do it. They can dance, for sure. On our next episode, the stage is set for the Irish dancers to perform. We judge pipe bands at the Highland Games, and we discover the role of the drum major in a marching band. <laughs>